Hello and welcome to the first of three workshops in the ABRF IPRG 2022 Cloud Computing Workshop Series. My name is Mike. I'm a senior research scientist at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. And today I'm going to show you how we perform shotgun proteomics analysis on the AWS cloud using the transproteomic pipeline. This workshop can be roughly broken down into three categories. The first of which is an introduction to the Amazon Web Services and how to use them. The second is an introduction to the transproteomic pipeline. And finally, putting the two together, I'll show you how you can use the transproteomic pipeline to analyze your data in the cloud. First, we'll start with the Amazon Cloud. The transproteomic pipeline cloud computing makes use of Amazon Web Services, also known simply as AWS. AWS is one of several publicly available cloud services that we chose because of its large footprint and its abundance of uh, tools for developers. AWS has what's known as an Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, and it's called Elastic because it can be spun up or spun down as needed, and it's very cost effective. You pay only for what you use. Also included is what is known as a simple storage service, or S3, which allows for easy transfer of data files to and from the cloud. The tutorial will give a brief overview of Amazon Web Services and instruct you on in how to create an AWS account, access the account, and transfer files to and from the cloud. All Amazon Web Services are available from a easy-to-remember website here, which I will jump to right now. Once on Amazon's AWS webpage, you can get an overview of all the services and products available at AWS. Uh, included in all of this is an idea of the scope of AWS, where their servers are held, where upcoming servers are. It's good to know that when using AWS, the ideal thing to do is to pick a server close to where you are to ensure optimal connectivity and performance of your work on the cloud. The very first step in creating your account is to click on this button up here on the right. Creating an AWS account is simple. What you need is an email address. And choose a name for yourself. Once you verify your email account, you can proceed with the uh, login process. I will let you do that on your own uh, rather than go through and create yet another account uh, for myself. But uh, be warned that the account here does require a credit card to complete. The credit card is so that any charges incurred uh, will be billed to the owner of the account. Now, creating an account does not cause any charges to be incurred. So don't worry about uh, creating any sort of billing issues immediately for creating an account. Owning an account is free. You will only ever be charged for cloud services that you use. So as long as you don't start up any cloud services, you won't pay for any cloud services. The other thing that's important to note is that when you set up an account here, you have what is known as a root user account. A root user account has all the access to the cloud, but also has the ability to set up sub-accounts. This is ideal if you happen to run a core facility at your institute. What you can do is set up a single root account for your core that controls all of the activity and billing for AWS cloud services. You can then create what is known as an IAM user account for each of the users of your cloud. This allows other users at your institute to connect to the cloud and run their analyses. Billing will all be provided to the root user account, and then that can be dispersed amongst the, the members of your core facility as required. Once you have finished creating your account, log into it as the root user.
Once logged into AWS, you have what is known as the console home interface. Here you can uh, access any of the tools available to the AWS under your account. Uh, good to note is that you are, your account name is located up in the upper right and your current uh, resource that you are connected to is listed as well. Since I am on the West Coast, I'm connected to US West through Northern California. It's best to choose a uh, AWS connection point that is close to you. There are lots of tools and services that are available inside the AWS console. However, I'm going to focus only on a few tools. The first of which is how to create IAM user accounts. Now, if you don't see this in the recently visited section of your console, you can simply go up to the top here and type in the service that you want. The first thing to do is to set up a new user account. By clicking on users on the left, you are brought up a list of your current users and their access privileges, as well as their recent activity. Clicking on the button on the right allows you to add new users. To add a new user, simply give them a username and then click both checkboxes, access key and password down here. This will give the user the privileges they need to access the cloud and use the TPP. Click on the next button and proceed. All users will require a set of permissions that allow them to access areas of the cloud that they need to use. If you've created user accounts before, you can simply copy the permissions from those existing user accounts to the new user. But I'm going to go through the steps as if this has not been done before. You can add additional tags to your new user, but I'm going to skip this step. Once the details are acceptable, you can simply hit create user. Once the user account creation has been completed, you will be given some critical information that you must take note of. Each user is assigned an access key ID. This is the actual key ID that will be used by that user to access the cloud. Also included is a secret access key that is hidden so that only the user knows what it is. This secret access key will not be shown here past this screen. It is recommended that you click this download CSV button to download the new user credentials and store them in a safe place. Also included is an auto-generated password that the user can use to access their own AWS management console. Another important piece of information for all users of IAM accounts is the account number to which their IAM user login belongs. If you forget what this number is, you can easily find it under your root user account. The account ID is listed at the top. Now that a user account was made, you must set the permissions for which it has access to the AWS cloud. To do that, click on the username in question. Currently, the only permission that the user has is to change their password. But what we want to do is give them storage access on the cloud so that they may upload and download files as necessary. To do this, click the Add Permissions button. You can copy those permissions from an existing user, but what I'm gonna show here is how to attach existing policies that are pre-made by Amazon Web Services. Click on the attach existing policies. And what we wanna do is allow S3 storage access for this user. So while there are many, many permissions available, and it is difficult to scroll through all of them, the easiest thing to do is to filter for the policy that you're looking for. There are currently 766 results, but we are interested only in file storage access on the S3. So we should type in S3. And here we can see that there are nine, 
nine results. You can limit S3 access to, for example, read-only access, but here we want this user to be able to upload and download uh, files as necessary off the S3 storage. So check the box for Amazon S3 full access. For your convenience, you can see that it is also a policy that has been applied to other users. After reviewing the new permission, click Add Permissions. If we go back to our user screen, we can now see that Super Scientist has access, full access to the Amazon S3 resources. This concludes creating user accounts. And next, I will show you how to access those accounts to upload and download files. To do so, simply sign out of the root account. This returns you back to the AWS web page where you can sign back into the console as your IAM user. To do this, click on IAM user and provide the 12 digit account alias. Next, provide the IAM username and password and sign into the account. Back in the console, you now want to find ES3. If it's not provided as a recently visited link, simply go to the top and type S3. This brings us to the scalable storage on the cloud. Files are stored in the cloud on buckets, which act much like folders on your desktop. The buckets actually belong to the account number held by the root user. However, since we gave all of our IAM users access to the buckets, those IAM users can see existing buckets that have been created. The user also has the ability to create a new bucket. To create a bucket, simply click the Create Bucket button. Create a bucket name and set the region where it will be stored, then scroll to the bottom and click Create Bucket. The bucket now appears in your list. If you click on the bucket, you'll see that it is empty. Creating a bucket does not incur any charges, but the moment you put a file in the bucket, you will then be charged storage fees. Pricing for storage can be found from Amazon's AWS website under the pricing link. To see the pricing for your region, simply select your region from the pull-down menu, and the prices are listed on the right. As you can see on the right, in general, standard pricing for this region is approximately two and a half cents per gigabyte per month. There are also costs involved in transferring files to and from the cloud. Going back to the bucket we created, you can add files to it by clicking the Upload button. This brings you to a web transfer interface where you can upload files like you would in other services such as Dropbox or Google Drive. However, this is probably not the most efficient way to transfer files to and from your bucket on S3. Instead, it is recommended to use an FTP client with S3 capabilities. One tool that we recommend is WinSCP, which is freely available to everyone. It is available at winscp.net. Click the Download Now button and install it onto your computer. After opening WinSCP on your desktop, it is easy to connect to the S3 cloud. Click on the New Session button. A login box will appear, and under the protocols, select Amazon S3. It'll automatically fill out the host name and port number, all you need is your access key ID and secret access key password. Simply put in your access key ID and secret access key and click login. Once connected to S3, you can see a list of available buckets. Click on the bucket that you want to access files from. And once inside the bucket, you can transfer files up and down as needed. For example, if I want to create a new temporary folder for some files that I want to upload, I simply click the New button here, put in a name, hit OK, go into Temp Folder, and then I can upload my files. I simply have to find the files that I want to upload from my desktop. 
WinSAP has several advantages over using the web interface from the AWS console, most notably the fact that you can upload and download files in parallel for increased speeds. This concludes how to set up and access an AWS account. Here is a summary of the web resources discussed. Next step, we move on to using the transproteomic pipeline on the AWS cloud. But before we begin, we need to make sure you have all the files that you need downloaded and installed on your computer. Primary amongst these is the transproteomic pipeline itself, which can be obtained from this website. From the transproteomic pipeline webpage, click on the download link and that'll bring you to our release page where you can select the version that you want to install. You will also need the tutorial data set, which was previously published by Cox et al. in MCP in 2014. The data set is downloadable from the Proteome Exchange using the identifier listed at the bottom here. The data set we are analyzing today contains two mixtures of human and E. coli proteins. The first mixture contains 10 micrograms of E. coli protein plus 60 micrograms of human protein. The second mixture contains 30 micrograms of E. coli protein plus 60 micrograms of human protein. So there is a one to three difference in the E. coli protein content between the two mixtures. The mixtures were then fractionated by off-gel and analyzed by tandem mass spectrometry on an LTQ Orbitrap mass spectrometer. In total, there are 143 files that are in the PXD repository and we are going to analyze all 143 of those on the cloud. We are also going to need a search database. So I created a human plus E. coli protein database from Unipro, and I also included common contaminants from CRAP. Once installed, the transproteomic pipeline is accessible through a command line interface or from a web browser. For the remainder of this tutorial, I will showcase the browser interface. If you install the Transproteomic Pipeline to its default location, you can access the web page from this URL listed here. Once inside the web page, click on the Petunia interface, which is the main interface. A login screen will appear. The password for a guest login is guest. Once inside the Petunia interface, navigating the Transproteomic Pipeline is done from this menu bar at the top. There are several pipelines that you can choose from, but for the remainder of this tutorial, we will be using the Comet pipeline. To see the steps in the pipeline, click on the TPP Tools tab. A list of steps in the pipeline will be shown on the left. Additionally, a bunch of utilities are available for use in your analysis of your data. The first step, which we are going to do locally on this computer, is to convert our data files from raw format to MZML. This is done through the MS Convert tool. File conversion is necessary because many of the open source analysis tools that exist cannot read vendor formats. And so it is necessary to convert those vendor formats into an open format that all tools can use. Click the Add Files button. In the file interface, choose the folder that contains your data files. Here I've created a folder called TPP Tutorial that contains the PXD dataset. Select all the raw files and then hit the select button at the bottom. All of the data files should now be listed in the choose files to convert to MZML. Now we need to set the parameters for the conversion. We want to centroid all the scans to make the files as small as possible because spectra searched with Comet work best on centroided data. We want to compress the peak list to make our files as small as possible. And because Comet supports the analysis of gzipped files, we will then gzip our MZMLs as well. Not all tools support this, but in our pipeline, it is compatible. This will also make the files smaller so that we use up less space on S3. There are some additional options that we can pass directly to the command line. I'm actually going to suggest one here. This particular command specific to MS convert 
removes any peaks that have an intensity value of zero. Doing this will ensure that we have the smallest files possible. When you're set, click Convert to MZML. When you run a command in the TPP, a job status window appears, showing you the activities of the most recent job. Here we can see the conversion command that we just executed and the current status of the command. This window does not automatically refresh, but you can hit the refresh button to see the progress of the job. As you can see, the first file has already been converted and the second file has started. This process will repeat 143 times until all files have been converted. We are converting these files locally to save the expense of storage and transfer on the cloud. But if this isn't an issue for you, you may wish to convert your files on the cloud as well. It is safe to leave this page at any time. For example, you can check the file browser for the TPP where you can see that all the raw files listed in the folder that we are currently converting, as well as the progress of some of the files that have already completed conversion. Don't worry, if you wanna check on the status of your job, just go back to the jobs button. It'll show you a list of uh, jobs that are currently running or previously run. The one that we are currently running is our MS Convert job, and we can click the View button to bring us back to the status window where we can see progress ha has continued on several more files and is steadily working towards completion of the job. While we are waiting for file conversion to finish, now is an ideal time to set up our bucket on S3. To do this, sign in under your IAM user account and create an S3 bucket. Select S3. And then create a new bucket for your files. Once this bucket is created, simply log out of the AWS console. Returning to the TPP, we can see now that the conversion job has finished. You can click the refresh button and you will see that all of our files have been made. Additionally, logs of each file conversion are kept for you to inspect. Should there have been any problems at all, you can review the logs to figure out where the error was and correct it. The next step is to upload these files to our S3 bucket. To upload the files, start a new session with WinSCP and connect to S3. Use your access key and secret access key to log in. Once inside, find the bucket that we created. Then locate your files on the hard drive and upload them. We only need to upload the mzml.gz files. WinSCP allows for concurrent uploads, which allows you to transfer the files quickly. I'm also going to transfer our FASTA search database, which we'll use for the comment search. After the transfer has completed, close WinSCP. Now let's move on to doing our analysis in the cloud. 
One of the easiest ways to launch the TPP in the cloud is to use the TPP web launcher for AWS by following this link. This will bring you to a new web page where you can start up an instance of the TPP in the cloud. To start up an instance of the TPP in the cloud, the first thing to do is use your key ID and secret and hit this little refresh button right here. This will sign you into AWS. Next, from this tool menu, go to Start Options. We'll bring up a new window here where you can select the type of instance you want to start. First, you don't need to install the demo or tutorial. Under Instance Type, you will see several options for the type of computer on the cloud that you want to run the TPP image. To learn more about the different instance types, go to aws.amazon.com slash ec2 slash instance dash types. Here it lists many of the different types of computers available to you. The ones that are listed in the TPP are called Compute Optimized. As you can see, the different models contain different numbers of CPUs, memory, and instance storage. Instance storage is important as some of our files will be stored locally on the instance that we are working with. If you need more power or hard drive space, you can choose a larger instance. However, it will cost more money. For our instance type, we will leave it at C5D Extra Large. Next, check the AMI, or the image of the TPP that we are going to spin up. There are many revisions. It's recommended to use the most recent revision when given the option. We set our auto shutdown to eight hours, meaning that if the instance has been idle for this amount of time, it will stop running. This is to prevent you from accidentally forgetting about your instance, walking off, and then getting charged for it later. As an added convenience, you can specify your bucket immediately right here, and it will sync with the contents when the instance is started up. Simply add the bucket name, and then click Sync with the S3 contents on Instance Startup. When ready, click the OK button. This has not started our instance yet. In order to start the instance, you have to click the Start Instance button right here. The moment you click Start Instance, you're using TPP in the cloud. It will take a moment or two for the instance to boot up. Once booting is finished, there's a little button up here on the upper right called Pop Instance. What this does is transfer the TPP instance out of the frame that it was on in this other window and into its own frame. This is important to ensure that the functionality in, built into the TPP works correctly. You are brought to a login page, and just like on your local computer, the password for guest is guest. Now you're inside the TPP in the cloud. The first thing you can do is click on account and then go to Amazon Cloud. This will bring up the cloud status page. You can see that we are connected, but currently nothing is running. This is normal. You can also go over to the file browser here and check the status of your files. Remember that we put 143 data files into our bucket. However, only 20 files currently appeared. This is because it takes a moment for the S3 to sync to our EC2 instance. Refreshing this page will show over time, the number of files shown increases. Please be patient and wait for all the files to appear in your instance. While we are waiting for the files, we can prepare for the Comet search. The first thing to do is to set up a Comet parameters file. This can be done from our file browser and then go into the subdirectory called params, which is contained with the instance. Here are a bunch of template parameter files for several tools in the TPP. We're interested in this Comet params files. We should select it and then hit copy. 
This will create a copy of the file to the clipboard in the TPP. We can now return to our data folder, scroll down to the bottom, and hit paste. This creates a copy of the Comet params file, which we can quickly search for right here. The reason why we use copies is because we don't want to damage the template file in case we want to use it for other uh, templates in the future. So we make our copy and then we can do all of our edits from here. So to edit this file, click on the params button located here. Inside the parameters, uh, you'll see all the parameters for Comet, as well as instructions for how to use those parameters. If you're unsure what any parameter is, you can click on this question mark over here, which will transfer you to a Comet web page describing the uh, parameter in question. I'm going to set up uh, the parameters for this search, which when we scroll down, what we want to do is use semi-digested shrimps and enzyme with a maximum allowed miscleavages of three. I am also going to add phosphorylation on serine, threonine, and tyrosine as a differential modification. Now, this is not something I expect to find in this data set, but I'm doing this to show the types of heavy lifting analyses that were meant for the cloud. Scrolling down, it looks like most of the rest of the parameters look okay. I'm gonna increase the spectrum batch size to make use of the resources afforded by the cloud. When all the parameters have been set, scroll to the bottom and click Save Search Parameters File. Once the files have finished syncing, scroll to the bottom and make sure that everything is there. You should see 145 files, 143 of which are our data files, plus our search uh, database and our comment parameters. If you need to refresh this page, you can do it in a couple of different ways, but the easiest thing to do is just hit the files button here at the top and then check to see that everything is listed down at the bottom. If the sync was not completed, you can manually invoke an S3 sync by clicking this button here. Once on this page, you can sync to your S3 bucket or sync from your S3 bucket. Right now, we only want to sync from our S3 bucket, if you can do so here. It starts a new job to sync the TPP to the S3 bucket. If we go to our analysis pipeline, we can see that the next step after converting the data files is to run the Comet search, which we intend to do here on the cloud. However, before we do that, we need to set up our FASTA database because we are using a target decoy-based uh, search method. So if we go over to this databases tool and click on decoy databases, this tool will randomly generate decoy sequences for every target sequence that we give it. To do this, we click the Add Files button and find our FASTA file. Now, there's a lot of files here. You don't have to scroll through looking for them. Just type FASTA up here in the finder, and here is our file. So we'll click on our Search Database file, click Select, and then we're going to use the default parameters here, which are to create randomized sequences using these DeBruin decoys. The tag for all the decoy proteins will be prefaced with the letters D-E-C-O-Y, and our output file name will be the same as our input file name with decoy appended to it. Then click Generate Decoy Databases. This generally, this step generally only takes a moment. When the job finishes, hit Refresh, and you can see that a new output file was generated in our folder, which is exactly the file we're looking to create. I'm gonna quickly open this file so that you may have a look inside, you can see that we have our original target sequences interleaved with decoy sequences for each of those targets. What is noteworthy is that while all decoy sequences are prefaced with the letters D-E-C-O-Y, they are also interleaved with either a zero or a one afterwards. 
And so this allows you to actually subdivide your decoys into two sets, a decoy zero set and a decoy one set, in case you wanted to do an entrapment approach in your analysis. If we go back to the transproteomic pipeline, we can now go to our comet search step. Over here, we need to add the files that we want to search. And here, it'll suggest mzxml or mzml, or in our case, mzmlgz files. We're just going to click the select all, which will select all 143 data files that we uploaded. Then scrolling to the next field, we need to provide our comet parameters. We'll add our files and we'll add the comet parameters that we had set previously. Scroll back to the bottom and you need to choose a sequence database. As you can see, the TPP suggested our default search database, but this is not the one we want. This is the one without the decoy sequences. So we want to remove this, scroll back down, click add files, search for FASTA, and select the file that contains both the target and decoy sequences. Once this is done, your Comet search has been set up and you need to start it, but be sure to start it on the Amazon cloud. If you select the local machine, then it's gonna run it just on this instance and it's not gonna make use of the cloud resources available to you. Click the button and a job starts. Now, when you click refresh, you will see something. You'll see that the job, it's executing commands, 143 of these commands to be exact, but the commands are just queuing. So they're, they're queuing each analysis up to the cloud, but there's a little warning here that's saying that there is no background process, that you need to start your queued services on the cloud. So to do this, we're going to go over to account and Amazon cloud. And here you can see that our current background processes are stopped. So we want to start these. So what you can do is select the type of computer that you want. And as you've seen before, there are many options, but we're gonna stick to just the C5-4X large, since this is the only, since this is more than enough power that for our analysis. And you need to set the maximum number of instances that you want. Here we wanna use a full 10 instances to get 10 searches running concurrently. And then the max utilization, I'm going to set it to one. Once this is set, click the restart button. Now you can see that your cloud status is set to running. So we go down, you can see the log or the last 20 lines of the log that's currently building. At the moment, it is transferring the files that need to be searched to the various instances in the cloud. At any time, you can refresh this page to get an update on the cloud status. You can see at this point, four instances have already started running as files have been transferred to various EC2 instances and have started their searches. This will continue to grow until we have 10 instances running because that is the maximum that we selected here. When a job finishes on any of these instances, it'll then check the queue down below and look for the next job to run. This will then begin on that instance and the process will continue until all jobs have finished. At this point, you can just sit back, relax, and let the cloud do its work. When the search is finished, it will be indicated in the jobs over here with a zero. The log shows that the Comet job had been run on the Amazon cloud and is finished. You can view the output. The output is a bunch of pepxml files and log files. The pepxml files are the actual search results from Comet. The log files contain a record of the Comet search. Next, we're going to validate these results and also combine the files into two subsets, one containing the E. coli 10 microgram files and the other containing the E. coli 30 microgram files. To do this, we go to the next step in the TPP pipeline 
which is analyze peptides. This brings up the X-Interact tool, which is a convenient tool that combines many different steps in the pipeline all at once. We are not gonna use all of these steps, but we are gonna use a few, namely peptide profit, eye profit, and protein profit, which validate the peptide spectrum matches and then infer proteins from them. We're gonna analyze each of the two subsets separately. First, we'll start with the E. coli 10 set. Click Add Files. Now you see all of your search results are listed all at once, mixed between the E. coli 10s and the E. coli 30s. So we wanna filter these for just the E. coli 10s at the moment. Once this is done, click Select, and then the Select button at the bottom. This chooses only the E. coli 10 results, which we will combine and name down here as an output file name, E. coli 10. Next, we'll move on to the peptide profit options. We are going to use decoy hits to pin down the negative distribution because we have decoys in our search database. We know our decoys begin with the word decoy, but we're going to restrict this, this known decoy set to the decoy zero uh, labeled decoy uh, sequences. We're going to have unknown decoy sequences labeled as decoy one. This does an entrapment analysis. It is a way to validate the validation software. Additionally, we're going to use non-parametric model and we're going to report the decoy hits Moving down to iProfit, we are also going to run iProfit. And then following this, we want to run protein profit following iProfit. We're going to leave all other settings the same, scroll to the bottom, and hit run X interact. This is the actual command line that we are running here. Unfortunately, it cannot be distributed over several instances on the cloud as yet. It is in fact a single command that is run and therefore is sequestered to just one instance of EC2, which happens to be the same instance that is running the TPP at the moment. We are going to have to repeat this process with the E. coli 30 set once this is finished. However, in the meantime, I'd like to point you to a resource, tppms.org, which brings us to our Transproteomic Pipeline webpage again. And over here on the right where it says site, you can see this publication right here that when you click on it, takes you to the PubMed listing for this publication where you can find a free full text uh, copy of this publication. This publication provides additional in-depth details about the transproteomic pipeline and the steps that I'm showing you today. Back in the TPP, we can see that the job has finished. When we refresh, we can see that there are three files that were created. I will go over these files in a moment, but for efficiency, I want to start the E. coli 30 analysis first. So go back up to TPP tools, analyze peptides, remove all of the E. coli 10 files that were there from the previous step. Go back to the bottom, add files filter for E. coli 30, select all, click select, scroll down, name this E. coli 30, and then apply the same parameters down for peptide profit and eye profit. Scroll to the bottom and hit Run X Interact. While this is running, we can go back to our previously viewed job and explore the files in more detail. So we click on Jobs, Viewed, and then X Interact, View at the end here, and we bring up our results from the last analysis. You can see that there are two PEPXML results and one PROTXML result. One PEPXML result belongs to Peptide Profit. The other one, indicated with iPro, came from iProfit. 
we'll look at the peptide profit result first by clicking on this PEPXML button. Once loaded, you will see a complete list of all the PSMs that were returned by the Comet search. You can click the summary button up here to see that there are almost 1 million PSMs. Not all of these PSMs are correct. Our goal with Peptide Profit was to determine which PSMs are most likely correct and to filter away the ones that are not. You can see on the left here that Peptide Profit added this probability column, which assigns a probability that the PSM was correct or not. You can click on any one of these probabilities here to bring up a models page for Peptide Profit. I'm not going to go into too many details, but this shows the different models at various charge states indicating the negative distribution determined by the decoys, as well as the target distribution determined by our human and E. coli peptides. We want to determine what is an appropriate probability cutoff for an acceptable error rate. So we click on sensitivity error tables, and we look here on this column here called error rate. And if we want to apply, say, a 1% error rate to our analysis, we scroll down here to 1%, and we see that the minimum probability that we can accept is 0 0.5880. So I'm going to close this, go back over to our uh, PEPXML viewer, and I'm going to set a minimum probability of just say 0 0.6 for simplicity, and then hit update page. As you can see, this removed about half of our peptide spectrum matches, leaving us only with the peptide spectrum matches that are most likely to be correct. We can then sort these by probability descending because peptide spectrum matches with the highest probability are the ones most likely to be correct. Once the sorting is completed, we can look through our PSMs. As you can see under the protein identifier for each of the PSMs, you don't see decoy at all. In fact, the first decoy is probably several pages down the way because having uh, assigned probabilities and controlled our error rates, we expect very few decoy proteins to be listed in these results. There are some other convenient tools that are available with this PEPXML viewer, one of which is filtering options, where you can filter by anything you like. Let's say if we're only interested in the E. coli proteins, we can put in E. coli there, and then scroll down to the bottom and hit update page. Once the page has updated, you can close the tab, and you can see now only E. coli proteins are listed. If you click on summary, you can see we further filtered down the number of PSMs that are both validated at a 1% error rate and belonging only to E. coli to about 160,000. Those 160,000 make up approximately 11,000 unique peptides and about 1,700 unique proteins. There is a lot more exploring that you can do but to move along with the tutorial, I'm going to close this tab for now and explore the protxml file, which is the protein inference file for all of these PSMs. As you can see, there are a bunch of proteins or protein groups listed, each of which has a probability. Like with peptide profit, you can click on this models button and then go to the sensitivity and error tables and determine a threshold that would give you an approximately 1% error rate. In this case, it would be a minimum probability of about 0 0.90. We can filter and sort as well, minimum probability of 0 0.90. You can also order these by let's say, the number of peptides and the number of PSMs in descending order. And this will list our proteins in what's probably somewhat indicative 
of the most abundant proteins first on down to the least abundant proteins last. However, we want to do a more accurate quantitation, perhaps, with a more sophisticated tool. So I will close this, and then we will wait for our E. coli 30 job to finish. To view the status of that job, simply click the running button, go to view, and wait for the job to finish. Once the E. coli 30 analysis is finished, we can proceed with quantitation. We are going to do label-free quantitation using St. Peter, which is this step down here. St. Peter accepts protXML files, and the reason why I wanted to do both the E. coli 10 and 30 data sets uh, before proceeding to this stage was so that both files can be included at once for a single batched analysis. Since we have low resolution data, we're going to set our resolution to low, and under this amount of protein sample measured, this can be an arbitrary number, but I'm just putting it in here so that the results of uh, this quantitation are something that's human readable and comparable. We'll also allow degenerate peptides in the protein quantitation. Then click Run St. Peter. The details of St. Peter and how it works is outside the scope of this workshop, but you can go to this URL right here to download and read the manuscript for St. Peter to get more information. Incidentally, this publication contains analysis of the same dataset that you are analyzing as part of this workshop. Click Refresh when the St. Peter jobs finish. The output of St. Peter is the same as the input, ProdXML files. Click on the first one, E. coli 10. This time when you view the ProdXML file, you'll see that new columns have appeared for quantitation. What we can do is under Filter and Sort, we can exclude any proteins that weren't quantified with St. Peter, and we can filter the protein names to just contain E. coli. We can also sort the proteins by St. Peter quantitation in descending order. This will now list our E. coli proteins in order of abundance. If we go back to the TPP, we can then open up our E. coli 30 protXML file and apply the same filters. You can then flip between the two tabs to compare the two protein subsets. If you look at the quantity numbers here, higher means more protein, you can see that the E. coli 30 results contained higher quantities of the same proteins than the E. coli 10. This is because the E. coli 30 subset contained more E. coli protein. Now, the ratio is supposed to be 3 to 1, but it doesn't appear to be this way. But there are some very good reasons for that, which are explained in the manuscript, and I'll leave it to you to explore them further. Back in the TPP, there are two critical steps that we must perform before finishing this workshop. The first is to take the results of our analysis and put them back in our S3 bucket. To do this, click on Files, click on S3 Sync, and then click Sync to S3. Do not forget this step. All the files for the analysis are currently sitting in the EC2 instance. When this instance goes away, so do your files. So it's essential that you transfer them back to your S3 bucket. After the transfer has finished, you can hit refresh to see the files that were moved back to your bucket. Make sure at the bottom of the report that your command was successful. Now you can close the tab that contains this EC2 instance. The second critical step is to stop the instance. This is done in the upper right corner, hitting the Stop Instance button. This finally shuts off the EC2 instance so that you are no longer charged for EC2 usage. 
To retrieve your analysis files, open up WinSCP and connect to Amazon S3. Go into your bucket, and in this local folder and data subfolder are your results files. You can download the ones that you want back to your desktop. Or simply go up to the top directory, grab the local folder, and drag all the files at once. When the files have finished transferring, you have successfully completed your cloud analysis and returned the results back to your local computer. Remember, though, that the files still exist in your S3 bucket. Files that remain in your S3 bucket will incur charges over time. You can delete them to reduce costs. This concludes the workshop for using the TPP in the cloud. I would like to thank Eric Deutsch and Luis Mendoza from the Institute for Systems Biology. And I'd like to thank the ABRF and my fellow IPRG committee members. With that, I would like to leave you with the links to the resources that were used in this workshop. Thank you.